Ladies and gentlemen, this is breakout session six. Digital consultant, Ms. Curran Clark, is here to discuss digital media transforming issues into opportunities. Ms. Clark, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, like, like she said, we're gonna talk a little about framing your narrative and building your online identity. Um, I'll just jump right into it. Uh, when I start on a new account or client, these are the things I like to focus on first. Um, branding, and what I mean here is mostly your logos, cover photos, your profile pictures, and getting everything like that in order. Um, I think it's helpful for everything to look the same across all platforms so, uh, so people can recognize you. It builds a predictability and when your followers start to see the same thing, same logo uh, come up in their timeline, they know to stop and actually read what you're posting. Uh, so it's best to be consistent. Um, someone who is really good at this is uh, someone you might know, it's uh, Taylor Swift. And next slide, please. Um, in preparation for her new single, she did this kind of consistent branding that I think is a good goal. Across all of her platforms, she switched the cover photos to the same thing, profile image is the same. And she actually went the extra step that every photo posted on her Instagram incorporated that same kind of color. Um, and what this did is when people started to see those colors on Instagram, they thought, oh, it's Taylor posting. And that's kind of the, the thing you want people to think of. If, if they see something that reminds them of you, they're going to stop. Um, obviously, that takes a little bit of time, but that's the ultimate goal, if we can go back. Um, and then defining your keywords and issues. I. What I mean by that is, uh, you know, what is your thing? What do you want to talk about? What is your focus? Um, I work in politics a lot, so for me, this is a lot of sitting down and figuring out, like, what are our top legislative goals? What are the things that we want to be super active on? And what are the things that we kind of want to avoid? Um, as an example, in 2016, one of Donald Trump's key issues was immigration. His key phrases was build the wall. Um, I bring this up not to get super political, but just because that is one of, one of the best examples of breaking down a very big policy issue into something that's small and easily digested and actually a call to action. Um, I have a lot, of, a lot of candidates who think that the best thing is to talk about their whole plan. It's a 2,500 page piece of legislation or 3,000 page piece of research, and I'm sure that they care about it more than anyone else in the world. Uh, but subscribers do not care about all 3,000 pages right away. You have to ease them into it. And if you can break it down into these um, easily digested keywords or phrases, they are going to be more likely to listen to the rest of your plan later. Um, so make it enticing, make it exciting, and that kind of goes into your tone, um, which is how you talk about it. Uh, every brand or every candidate um, has a different way of talking to their audiences, and you can see that when you are scrolling through Twitter or Facebook. Uh, and it's fun to get to decide what your, brand, what your tone should be. Like, are you passive? Are you more hostile? Are you funny, friendly? Um, there's no real rule to how you should be. It's just that you need to decide and stay consistent with that. Um, Sometimes when I'm starting on this project, I actually make a document with these three things, uh, just, just for my own reference. Um, what's your tone? Is it scholarly, authoritative? What are the top goals, whether that's to raise awareness or create a better sense of community or raise money, whatever it is? Um, and then those key issues going back, like for Trump, it would be immigration. And then when those things pop up in the media, you know, you know how your story and your narrative fits into those, those issues. Um, when you have it all laid out, it's easier to remember what kind of content's relevant to you. Um, and two slides, sorry. Uh, 
And when you are super consistent with this and you're properly branded and your social media is very well focused, the media will come to you for, for the news. They will view your post as press releases and if that changes how you want to talk about stuff online, then you might want to lay that out in the beginning. <laughs> um, the need for a traditional press release is kind of unnecessary now. Anything that you put out on Twitter, they can use exactly like it's coming from your official spokesperson. So I don't say that as much as a warning, but as something that's empowering. Um, your, con your original content is news, and it will make news. Uh, slide. Uh, now, I don't think that every every group needs to be active on every platform. Um, if your audience is not on Pinterest, you should not force yourself on Pinterest. I promise they'll probably survive without you. Uh, but each platform does have its strengths. Uh, Facebook is still trending older. Instagram is growing in popularity. It's a little bit younger. LinkedIn is valued among industry professionals. Uh, and Twitter still breaks a lot of news. They're all useful in their own ways. Um, I do think it's important, though, that your tone is, is consistent across all platforms. If you're very scholarly on Facebook, you don't want to jump on Instagram and start posting a lot of Kermit the Frog memes. Um, you want to make sure that you're still, you're still in character, you're still working towards those same goals and same key issues. Um, I know you guys have probably done a little bit of best practices each week, but real quickly, these are just my thoughts on what to post um, on Facebook. Links, graphics, videos. Um, videos are, are optimized right now on Facebook. The more video appropriate content you have, the better. If you have a spokesperson that's on the news a lot or um, anything you can grab clips from TV and post those up or even turning things that could be static images into three second videos like, you know, it's Army Reserve Day, make it a little GIF instead of a static image and it will be optimized. It's more likely that it will show up in someone's feed. Um, and on Instagram, obviously pictures, <laughs> videos, short alerts are good and utilizing your stories is the best thing right now. Um, stories are getting great engagement and finding a, a good way to use those will really help you out. Uh, I also think the more you're using your stories and people are clicking them, um, the better feed placement you will have, just the way that Instagram is optimizing right now. So even if you put an all text alert up in your story that says, you know, hey, check out the new post on our website, that will help you actually show up sooner in somebody's feed later when you do have a picture to post. Um, one thing with Instagram right now is links are really tough. You can't click them, and the swipe up feature is only for people with 10,000 followers or more. I don't know about you, but I'm not lucky enough to work with only accounts with 10,000 followers or more. So um, best to keep those links on other platforms. Slide. Um, on LinkedIn, links are still doing well also. Infographics are really popular here. Really, anytime you can get a lot of information into a visual is going to do pretty well on social media. On Twitter, like I mentioned before, breaking news is going pretty strong. Um, and facts and stats always do really well with engagement. Don't need a lot of personality behind them, just here's the stat. Um, slide. Uh, and now, just a little bit about controlling your narrative. Uh, a huge part of that is telling your own story. I've been told to stomp my foot at this first point. <laughs> Break your own news. This is one of the biggest parts of being on social media, um, good and bad news, you can be in charge of it. The, we don't have to wait or trust the media to break our own stories anymore. Um, we can take the reins. And I know a lot of organizations actually have the resources to do their own studies and their own, um, create their own stats. If you can do that, do it and do it often and release that information as your own. Don't, don't count on the relationships with other publishers. You can be that source. Um, but if you don't have those resources, at the very least, you can still, you can still tell your own story. Um, post your own pictures. If, you've, if your group is doing something great, you talk about it. And break the story just like a real <laughs> journalist would. Um, tell your audience why it's important, why this matters, 
um, why it's innovative or unique, and how it's helping you move towards your goals. Uh, but be the first one to put that story out there. Don't wait for, it to, don't wait for someone else to do it. Um, and being present, what I mean by this is just posting enough original content that users know to come to you for the expert opinion on that subject. Uh, it builds your trust with an audience. If you're always talking about those key issues, they'll start to come to you instead of the media. And if anyone says anything contrary to your talking points, they'll, if they really trust you, they will not care about that. They'll still come back to you uh, for the truth. Um, Using reliable sources consistent with your narrative. Now, I really like to post original content. If you have the resources to do your own news all the time, that's awesome. If not, um, make sure the sources you are using are consistent with your, with your story. If there's a source that is just constantly against your organization or against your goals, you don't have to post links from those sites. You don't have to combat uh, that narrative. Just don't post it. and you'll be fine. Um, and then knowing when to respond, that's kind of the same thing. If there's someone that's always giving you a hard time, if there's a guy on Twitter that is just always attacking your organization, just leave him be. You don't have to give him attention. It'll probably drive them more crazy if you just ignore them. <laughs> um, it creates more of a story if you respond. Uh, like I touched on earlier, part of controlling your narrative is really building that uh, predictability with your audience. Um, we want everyone who likes our pages to really be a walking, talking promotion of our ideals. And a lot of that is just working on the community building from, from day one. Um, slide. This is pretty basic stuff. Responding to comments, uh, responding to messages, monitoring your page. Um, I don't think there's any shame in deleting those com deleting comments or hiding comments that are, that are offensive or crude. Um, and it's good to monitor for those because it can become an unnecessary story when um, there's a particularly terrible comment that was left up on a popular page or something like that. But in general, I think there's a great value in responding to comments uh, that are polite. If, if someone's like, hey, nice graphic, say thank you. Someone asks a question, answer it. If they have a question you can't answer but you're working on it, just let them know that you're working on it. Um, that stuff goes a long way with building loyalty with your following. And, um, and it really pays off in the end. They're, they will remember. Basically, just customer service um, and treating your followers like they're real people. But uh, remember that they're real people. <laughs> Slide. <laughs> So asking for opinions from your following is really great for building, uh, building that engagement. The numbers also really look good when you ask for opinions and you got thousands of people commenting. Looks awesome on a report to your boss. <laughs> but sometimes those comments that you ask for can be not so great. And if you're going to do that and stay ahead of a media narrative, you have to monitor it very closely. <laughs> um, you don't want to shift shift focus from your, from your actual key issues more to uh, the terrible comments your following's making. Um, now we can kind of make fun of some people who didn't do this so well. Slide. <laughs> In 2014, Mountain Dew had a contest to name their, name their new flavor. Sounded like a good idea, um, but it wasn't. <laughs> Unfortunately, the contest was actually hijacked by a group on 4chan, uh, and they actually crashed the website, leaving Mountain Dew with only these top names that, as you can see, really are more of a, cause more of a need for an apology than a, a celebration. It, it was probably the most media that Mountain Dew ever got, but not the best. <laughs> um, Similarly, Bodie McBoatface uh, seemed like a good idea at the time, I'm sure. A British government agency actually asked the internet for suggestions on the name of their polar research ship. Um, they, they had three ideas in mind. It was Shackleton, Endeavor, and Falcon. The internet named it Bodie McBoatface. So. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta kind of keep that in check. Don't give people too much of an opportunity to, uh, 
to disregard your actual goal. <laughs> um, so big whoops there. So <laughs> those are a couple of examples and they're really fun to laugh at, but it would be really frustrating to deal with, um, especially when these people are trying to build hype for their actual goal, like a new flavor or a new research ship. Um, no one remembers those things in the end. What they remember is that th that Mountain Dew had a really offensive contest in that Bodie McBoatface is a really silly name. No one remembers why that's what that ship is doing. No one remembers that there's a new flavor and that's not what you want. Um, luckily, I think there are some better ways to get that engagement up. That slide. And sorry, one more. <laughs> uh, a poll is a great way, but <laughs> with pre-selected answers. No one, don't let people fill in their own, like the Bodie McBoatface scandal. Um, with a poll, you're still asking users for their opinion, but you're kind of fielding for those, for those answers. Um, Facebook and Twitter now have their own polling features. They're super easy to use. Instagram just rolled out a story feature that has multi, uh, multi-choice polling options, which is a great way to increase your engagement there also. Um, so a way better way to ask for an opinion without subjecting your entire following to the dark hole that is uh, the internet. Quiz or a survey, kind of the same thing. It's another chance to weigh in, um, but provides a safety net for you with those pre-selected answers. Of course, there's a warning here too. Always make sure that your Pre-selected answers are all favorable to you. Um, slide. I just grabbed this screenshot earlier this week from the Senate Democrats. They took a little bit of a risk here asking users to vote for their favorite Supreme Court justice. And they did not choose two of their own Supreme Court justices. I would say that was the mistake here. Um, this got great engagement, as you can see, as 230, over 230,000 votes. Awesome on paper but I do not think this is the answer that they wanted. <laughs> and I think that uh, if you just had chosen two favorable, you could mitigate a lot of risk here. Um, of course, if, if you are going to have these kind of open polls or open comments, I'm not saying you can't do it, but uh, I would just make sure you monitor it very closely and maybe have somebody's entire job being monitoring those comments because uh, screenshots will exist forever and you should have a plan to how, to, how you're gonna respond and, um, and deal with it if it goes out of your hands. Uh, sorry. So even if, sorry? So, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand, can you go back? You're, what are you suggesting that they would have, that they, would have they should have put up different names? Different yes, if, if your goal was to um, raise awareness for your favorite liberal court justices, you should choose two, <laughs> two of your two liberal court justices um, that would have celebrated their own candidates. What happened is they celebrated conservative nominees instead of liberal nominees, um, and I don't think that was their ultimate goal. <laughs> um, but sometimes when you're, even when you're doing really well and all of your digital media is locked in and you're doing great, there are still some things that will disrupt your narrative. Um, just a couple examples, uh, national emergencies or um, public relations crisis that somehow affect your organization. Uh, slide. And these are just, I have a couple do's and don'ts for um, how you would handle those disruptions. Thank you. Uh, so for a national emergency, whether that's a hurricane or God forbid a terrorist attack or something like that, um, you really should take a break from your reg regularly scheduled content. You don't wanna be the only one that's not talking about the bigger issue here. Um, being a source of reliable information, if you have anything to share on on the ground efforts or fundraising or shelter or anything like that, go ahead and put that out there. Um, retweeting and sharing, rel sharing relevant posts uh, if the same kind of thing, if there's any emergency information from a verified source that you want to get out there on your page to your following, go ahead and do that. Um, and then show your general support for those affected. I think we all see these during crisis, um, hurricanes and thing like, things like that. During Hurricane Harvey, 
every every organization, every company had a Houston Strong image in their own branding um, on Instagram, on Facebook, and people really feel loyal to that. They like to share it, um, and it's a good way of building that sense of community. It makes people feel like we are all in this together, and that's a good thing. Um, I wouldn't rush to put out any information that hasn't been confirmed. We've all seen these mistakes here. Um, Cory Booker during Hurricane Sandy was accidentally tweeting the wrong polling information to his constituents on election day. Um, not good, and we've seen some politicians mean to post relief effort fundraising and actually link to you know shady GoFundMe pages. That's uh, not what you want to do. And again, that will break a lot of news. It's a lot more of a headache, so just don't rush to put it out if it hasn't been confirmed. Um, and the other thing that probably comes up, it's a little less community oriented in, an, in a different negative way is the PR crisis. And that could be a scandal of an affiliate of your organization or maybe, maybe someone did post the wrong thing and you have, you have to deal with the fallout there. Um, whatever it may be, it's something that shifts the focus from your day to day uh, slide. For a PR crisis, I would respond um, respond thoughtfully in coordination with the rest of your team. The stressor here is in coordination. Um, if there's a, a PR crisis that affects your org, org um, I would make sure that you're all on the same page. Don't be putting something out on social media that your spokesperson wouldn't be saying on the news. Um, don't, be the, don't be the one to tweet before you've come to an agreement on how you're actually going to handle this crisis. It should be a very unified front. Um, and if you've got someone who is responding, who's on TV, put, put all those videos up on, on your pages, um, videos up on Facebook. If you've got a really good clip, put it up on Instagram. I'd actually put it up on Twitter, too. Just, just go all out. Show everybody that you're responding. Um, and I'd monitor your comments and focus on community building. Uh, really take that chance again to say thank you to the people who are supporting you, and then if there are people who are a little bit too negative and maybe a little bit too angry with you, um, you might want to hide those comments and delete them. In this kind of situation, it might actually help you blow off some steam to delete some, some negative comments. Um, the silver lining here is that these kinds of things do actually bring a large audience who may not be familiar with your page to your page. Um, gives you a chance to play back your greatest hits when the scandal falls down a little bit. Um, last charity event you did, last thing that really went over very well. Once the scandal dies down a little, replay that stuff for the people who might not know that about you. Convince them that you know this was a big this was a big thing for however long, usually probably only a couple days, but it's not everything that your organization is. Um, and some things I wouldn't do, uh, you don't want to respond too quickly. If something's trending on Twitter for like an hour, don't, don't respond to that. Wait, wait and see how it plays out. Um, as we know, these kinds of things evolve so quickly in a digital age, and you don't want to be the first one to release a statement and then have to walk it back. Um, you see this happening basically all the time now. <laughs> People respond way too fast to what was a Twitter trend and uh, by the next morning the real story comes out. You totally responded to something that wasn't even, uh, it was fake news <laughs> and, and then you have to walk back um, and that kind of, you lose a little credibility with your following there. So, so don't respond that quickly. Um, and then, especially if you're dealing with an accusation of someone, if someone in your org organization is accused of something, um, don't repeat the lie, especially if it's trending. Um, the way trending topics work online is, you know, the more people who say that phrase, the, the longer something's going to trend. So you don't want to actually exaggerate a scandal by repeating the same phrase, and then your supporters by retweeting or sharing the post are keeping that negative phrase trending longer. So I like to drop the negative trend um, slide. This is my example. If I was caught lip syncing at the VMAs, which I wouldn't do, that's a lie. I never lip sync. Um, I would not respond, I was not lip syncing, because the, 
the trending topic is this lip syncing. I would respond, I always sing live and hope that people retweeting, my millions of fans retweeting and uh, sharing my posts would help this, this phrase trend over the former bad scandal. Um, slide. I think uh, for these PR crises, they always seem like a bigger deal at the time, so I think it's just important to remember to breathe. Um, these things really do pass quickly, especially in 2019. There will be a new threat. There will be a new uh, scandal by the next hour. Um, it's easy to get caught up when your mentions are blowing up and stuff like that, but it it really is important to remember that it will normalize. Um, with the exception of maybe ongoing criminal proceedings, it's all over pretty quickly. Um, if you've decided to address it and if you've put out your statement, then you've done your due dil diligence. Uh, just get back to posting regularly, get back into your group, and before you know it's like it never happened. Um, and that always feels good. Slide. And um, I'm, that's all I've got for you today if you want some questions and answers. Thank you for that. Uh, Tony O'Brien, I just wanted to uh, to reinforce something that I, I, I like that you said and then I'll ask you a question about how you consult with people in these situations. One, um, the point about uh, taking a look at your content schedule when there are um, national disasters or tragedies or you know things like school shootings, um, that's something that we may not often think about, but I, it's something that we pay attention to and it's good to put into your SOPs. Because if you use tools such as you know, Hootsuite or something else where you're scheduling content out and something happens in the world, uh, you have to be uh, you know, keyed in and you have to, to pay attention to how you're still pushing stuff out. So for example, for us, uh, if there's something like a school shooting, SOP is return, go to the, go to the scheduled content, we scrub it uh, of things with weapons, for example. So that's just another example of, although we may have a deliberate approach to what we're putting out, we still have to pay attention to the environment and the, the, uh, the audience, because they get a vote, and then be reactive to that. But I wanted to ask you a question about, um, <clears throat> um, in these situations, <clears throat> excuse me, in these situations, like, if you could kind of maybe take us behind the scenes with, uh, because, you know, sometimes these things spin up. They, you know, the, a social media, you know, a crisis or a, an issue that starts out on social media may blindside the leadership or, or the team. And then, you know, how do you take a look at when you're gathering the team around? How do you do the monitoring? Are there recommendations on, like, tools maybe uh, that you use to kind of get a sense of that as you start to formulate a strategy, that, you know, in a response that you were talking about? Um, I still use TweetDeck actually to monitor like hashtags or certain accounts that I think are going to be uh, breaking news that's relevant to uh, to the client or to the organization. Um, and I think that's good to have a social media monitoring tool, just keeps you up to date on what other people are saying. Um, I also like to set up Google alerts a lot on, key, on those key issues and phrases. Um, see what the conversation is surrounding those and where you can find an opportunity to kind of comment back um, that's in line with your goals and your uh, where you can use those key phrases again. Um, so monitoring the conversation is, is very important. And then it also just really depends on, um, on the tone, tone of your group. Like do they want to respond to this hostily or are they going to kind of let it die out? Like what is more in in line with their personality online um, and just keeping that in mind. I think most of the time the most important thing is to just be on the same page. Don't have uh, your spokesperson saying a different thing than your Facebook page, um, than your Twitter. Like make sure it's all saying the same thing even if it, it uh, wasn't your favorite statement. <laughs> make sure it's a consistent one. I'm Sarah Pryor from uh, West Point. Uh, so we had to deal with an incident where cadets stole the Air Force Falcon uh, mascot. 
And so social media was kind of blowing up and we had to monitor and, uh, you know, the comments were getting out of hand. And so we had to kind of like say what to delete and stuff like that. And then some of the uh, commenters even started noticing like public affairs is uh, really working hard right now um, in the comment section. So my question is, where do you kind of draw the line of, you know, what you're deleting and what you're leaving, because, uh, um, you know, it. I was also taught, like, you can't certainly delete stuff because of First Amendment issues and stuff like that. So it's like, where do you draw that line? And I, I think every organization will have its own rules about how they handle that, and it's good, it's good to talk about it uh, first thing when you're working on a social media platform. Um, my personal rule is if I wouldn't want my grandmother to read it, then I don't feel bad hiding it. Um, but it just does, it, it depends, you have to pick your evil there. Like if there's going to be a little bit of a scandal um, because you did delete it, are you more comfortable handling that than you are handling um, how it might negatively affect you to leave this comment up? If, if someone's like tweeting something, like terrible words that are offensive or crude that you don't want associated with your brand, are you, do you feel more comfortable just deleting those um, than you would leaving them up and not having to deal with someone mad that you might have deleted an offensive comment? For me, I usually think it's like easier to defend that, you know, I don't want these, these, these words are negative, they do not re represent my brand, and I'm ha we're happy to encourage a, a rational discourse, but we're not going to encourage these kinds of comments. Um, just let people know those are the rules. If you want to comment on the page, you know our guidelines. So, play play nicely or or don't play. Uh, Thomas Hamilton, U.S. Army, Europe. Um, have you found a good tool such as TweetDeck for Facebook? I love TweetDeck because I can separate it. I have allies and partners, stateside units. I have a ton in my tweet deck, but following on Facebook or monitoring on Facebook is a little more time intensive. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you right there. I actually don't have a great answer for that. I wish I did. Um, it helps if you have a lot of extra hands on board to just manually search Facebook in the morning. Um, and, and Facebook does come up in Google Alerts now. Uh, posts, if they're trending, like I see them come up um, in a Google Alert, so sometimes that helps. But I don't have a a great tool that it's like equal to the real time updates of uh, TweetDeck. I wish if anyone finds one, please let me know. <laughs> yeah, can everybody hear me? Okay. So my name is Mike Navin. I'm a TRADOC public affairs officer. Um, so I know this is opportunity driven, but this is kind of counter opportunity driven. So when you have a site, a social media platform that has a pretty large follow audience. Um, and they totally pretend to be the media and they want to be treated like the media, but they don't play like the media. And they're consistently in your information environment. How do you feel? Uh, we have a technique of dealing with this particular organization, um, but it's, it kind of mocks the military. And then you do have people internal to your um, organization that are feeding it. Um, how do you deal with that and how do you manage that uh, some say embrace them, some say ignore them. Uh, what do you, and they have a really uh, key, key um, capturing the attention of your audience and your leaders. So how do you think you would deal with something like that? It's always a tough one if they're already making, um, if they're already in touch with your audience. For the most part, I think um, if your audience hasn't heard of them, don't bring it to their attention. So don't retweet even if it's a slam dunk. Uh, if you definitely got them and your joke is funny and your clap back is perfect, in general, I'm just like, don't even bother introducing your audience to the, this account that is making fun of you. Um, but if they're already in touch with your audience and you're, and you're pretty confident with that, um, if you have a good, if you have a well-planned like response, if you have a good way to counter their narrative, and you know it's a, a slam dunk, go ahead and go ahead and say something back to them if that's in line with your tone. Um, but it is one of those hard ones. You might just 
have to ignore it. If there's, no, if there's nothing to respond that doesn't build up that same um, negative that they're putting out there, you might just have to ignore them um, and keep going with your content that is better, that builds up at all of the respect that they're pretending that you don't have. Thank you so much.